Hey everyone, it's our season finale. We still have next week's Just The Plate episode, but this is our last long form interview and it's with one of the world's best. Well, you already know who it is because you downloaded this episode and it was incredibly fascinating to sit and talk with Chef Grant Ackett's for a hundred reasons. But for one, we started this season of Beyond the Plate with Chef Thomas Keller, who spoke about Chef Ackett's in his interview. And now here we are ending the season with... Chef Grant Ackett's himself, who was a sous chef for Thomas Keller. So thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next season in season five. And I am excited to share that we are currently in production for another podcast series we piloted earlier this season, which you may have noticed called Cook Tracks. Cook Tracks is our audio recipe cook along podcast. So be sure to visit cooktracks.com to learn more about that project. And you'll hear a little more about that after this episode ends. Season four of Beyond the Plate is presented by Martin's Famous Potato Rolls. Martin's was founded in the heart of Pennsylvania Dutch country in 1955. Martin's Potato Rolls are the number one branded hamburger bun in America, and as I like to say, they can make almost any burger taste better. Heads up all, next month is the South Beach Wine and Food Festival Burger Bash, which Martin's takes part in too. Tons of great chefs using those delicious potato rolls. But here's what I love about Martin's. They believe in giving back to their community. They support hundreds of charitable organizations, food banks, after-school programs, disaster relief, and others. So to learn more about Martins, visit potatorolls.com or follow them on social media at Potato Rolls. Martins, we thank you. You know, like I say often in the kitchen and in the dining room, one of our best creative approaches is to chase the impossible. That's like how the balloon came to be, and that's how the tabletop dessert came to be. It's like if you can think about something that is throughout culinary history never been achieved, and you put your effort towards that, even if you come really close to figuring it out and accomplishing it, that's like a huge win. But if you actually hit the ball and it goes over the fence, then that's something. Welcome to Beyond the Plate, a podcast where we sit down with the world's culinary elite to explore their journey with food and their passion for giving back. I'm Cappy, and in this week's episode, we sat with Chef Grant Ackett's. I'm going to keep this one short, everyone, because you can Google this guy and find loads of information on him. But here's the gist. He's the executive chef and co-owner of Alinea in Chicago. Also, Next Restaurant, the Aviary Cocktail Lounge, Royster, St. Clair Supper Clubs. Got a couple places in New York as well. He was Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. He has won multiple James Beard Foundation Awards. He has been getting three stars in the Michelin Guide since 2011. And there is a amazing Netflix Chef's Table episode on him. This guy, as I mentioned earlier, was a sous chef to Thomas Keller at the French Laundry. He has the Alinea cookbook, which was self-published. He also has a memoir that he wrote with his business partner, Nick Kokonis, called Life on the Line. This is about his journey in the restaurant business and his battle with stage four tongue cancer, which we talk about during this episode. This is pretty fun. We talk about what 10-year-old Grant Ackett's was like growing up in Michigan. His parents owned a diner, so we talk about what he misses from that diner in Michigan. And we get into his creative process as well as how this guy, being at the top of his game, takes criticism. Last but not least, we talk about how he gets back to the community, to the University of Chicago Hospital. This is where he was treated. He had a clinical trial. He was treated for his tongue cancer and is now cancer-free. So please enjoy this conversation as we go beyond the plate with Chef Grant Atkins. I'm sitting here at Alinea. So we started this season, this season four of the podcast, we started with Chef Thomas Keller. And I know you work for him at French Laundry, but I'm curious, if I were to ask you what three words you would use to describe him, what would you say? Hmm, probably the three best words to describe Chef Keller would be disciplines, patience, and passionate. Yeah. So 
we asked him the same question okay. about what he would say about mm -hmm. himself. About himself, yeah. right? Oh boy. <laughs> and he said persistence uh -huh. was one word, evolution was a word, mm -hmm. and patience. Mm, good. So there you go. So here, I'm curious, what three words would you use to describe yourself? Oh boy, it's always <laughs> hard to pull yourself out of the bubble and look at yourself, you know? I would say relentless, dedicated and observant. I like it. I like yeah. it. All right. So you grew up in Michigan? Yeah. Awesome. Small town in Michigan, about 3,000 people when I grew up there. Nice. Yeah. Uh, what was 10 year old Grand Ackets like? Like, what were you getting into? You know, because I grew up in such a small town, it was very much a, an agricultural community. So a lot of farming was the driver of, of the economy there. And it was very rural. So we were outside riding ATVs and, and doing a lot of hunting. Those were sort of the childhood activities. But also my mother and father owned a restaurant. And so that that my grandmother owned a restaurant when I was born, and then my mother and father opened their first restaurant when I was about five. So, you know, that literally going to work with my mother, that was daycare. Really? Did you, you spend, know? so you spent a lot of time at oh, the restaurant? Oh, tons of time in the restaurant. And, you know, you, you make a, you're, you're, at that age I was, and still am very curious. And so rather than just plop me down on the floor with a bunch of Lincoln logs and Legos. It was like, why don't you help in uh, quotes, yeah. right? <laughs> so, you know, at a very, very early age, you, you start interacting with people that are working, you know, and that work ethic becomes a part of your ethos. And, you know, you think you're helping, you're probably getting in the way, but yet those are such formidable years that you're, you're developing social skills and you're developing an understanding of the satisfaction of taking a task to completion. And you're watching your, your two biggest inspirations, your mother and your father, do that hours and hours of the day. And so you, as a young child, you go, well, this must be the correct way. This is how I was learning. And so you try to emulate that. And I think that was a huge part of um, my work ethic going into high school, kind of culinary school, and then ultimately when I worked at the French Laundry, that resonated with me because I saw that directly in, in Chef Keller. So it felt very it felt very familiar to me, it felt very nurturing, it felt very mentoring to me to be a, a, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, all the way up until I graduated high school, and then to get dropped back into that environment when I, you know, when I, I guess I was 22 when I started there. So it felt like, okay, here's this father figure. We're in this familiar space, a kitchen, and the ethic is there, the, the sense of gratification, uh, feeding people and, and taking these very complicated multi-step processes to and making, making them come to fruition. It, it, it all was like familiar and, and satisfying to me. Did you go from high school to CIA? I did, you yeah, did? Okay. right away. Um, so graduated in probably June of 1992 from high school and went to uh, culinary school in February of 93. Got it. So I went right straight away. Yeah. So with that, that restaurant your, your family owned, was that like your dinner table per se? Often. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we would, it was a diner, so it was breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. And, you know, I got, that was the other thing with that environment. Obviously, I was so incredibly young, so I always had older friends, you know, so the dishwashers were in high school when I was seven, and they would, you know, mischievously tell me stories about their <laughs> high school life. Right. And so you, you tend to grow up, um, for better or worse, really quickly in that environment. But like, yeah, we would, we would all take our, our, our meal break together and we would cook our own food at that meal break. And then we would go sit in the dining room for 20 minutes and eat it and, and talk about 
life. Is there, life. Is there a dish you uh, miss uh, or remember from the diner? I mean, there there's several. There was I was a big fan of Reuben sandwiches, and you know when it was such an incredible experience when I didn't know it then, but when you're when you're cooking, how many young people are able? either physically or or have the resources to cook their own meal like almost every day most people don't even learn how to cook until they're adults right right? they're never they're never forced to they're never even asked to so i think that was really interesting for me because then i got to really personalize like most people when you say hey cook yourself mac and cheese you know if i tell my 16 year old that now he grabs a box of craft mac and cheese and he follows the directions to him, that's mac and cheese. To me, it was like, well, one, can I explore? Can I put a little bit of white pepper in it? Can I put some leftover bacon from breakfast in it? Can I, you know, add extra cheese sauce? Can I do this, this, or that? And then you, you, you're able to personalize. You're able to kind of be creative. So with you had it. that curiosity. Yeah. Like when that and so out. I think that was important early on for me. Yeah. That's cool. So can you please open a diner in Chicago? <laughs> but let me ask this another way. Yeah. Would you ever open a diner in Chicago? <laughs> so funny you mentioned that my business partner now for almost 17 years, predating Alinea, if we, if we consider the actual building of Alinea, he always said to me at some point in this journey, I want to I want you to build the Ackett's Diner here in Chicago. And I always laughed it off because obviously in 2002, when him and I started talking, that was the furthest thing from my mind that I I wanted to do. I wanted to ascend the culinary fine dining and do this uber modern progressive avant-garde cooking. The last thing I want to do is cook what I grew up cooking. I was rebelling against that, basically. Fast forward to last year when we opened the St. Clair Supper Club, which is probably the closest iteration to anything like a diner that I've cooked in, you know, 30 years. You know, he was like, see, this is fantastic. What a great story. You've come full circle and we're cooking prime rib and mashed potatoes and this is great. I think eventually we'll probably really put our whole foot into the diner thing here in Chicago. I mean, why not, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So you mentioned your 16-year-old um, kid. I, know, I believe you have uh-huh. two kids. You're a parent. Do you, uh, how do you inspire, how do they inspire you and your creativity? Um, in, in very different ways. Are they so into food? They enjoy eating it. They, <laughs> they show no interest. They're 16 and 18, and they show no interest in being in the restaurant business at all, which obviously I'm completely fine with, whatever makes them happy. But yeah, like it's been really interesting watching their their arc through their teen years. They were, when they were probably, say, around six to eight, they were super adventurous. Anything that I would put in front of them, we would go out here in the city or if we happen to be traveling together, anything I would put in front of them, they would just gobble up. But then inevitably you get into your teenage years and your 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 likes become very narrow, <laughs> you know, pizza, sure. uh, that sort of thing. So that's been fun watching them kind of seriously poke at food and really enjoy it and not enjoy it and me being the observer there trying to go like well why don't they like that like my my 18 year old's like dad i hate cheese but he loves grilled cheese and he loves pizza so you don't really like hate <laughs> cheese you know <laughs> so what, you know so what is it what is that perception yeah of hating cheese so i try to think about it that way and then apply that to the 130 people that we have coming in here on a nightly basis. And if they if they themselves think that they don't enjoy sea urchin, what is it about it that they don't like? And how can I apply that to our cooking in the kitchen to maybe make it more approachable or to think about it from a flavor perspective? Is it the iodine quality? Will they not like lobster? How, what goes with iodine to make it more how, appealing? Yeah. And, you know, like That's all so those sort of things. It's like creativity meets innovation meets challenge. Yeah, meets, challenge, right? It's I mean, wild. Challenge is, you know, like I say often, like in the kitchen and in the dining room, one of our best creative approaches is chase the impossible. You know, that's like how the balloon came to be. And that's how the tabletop dessert came to be. It's like if you can think about something that is throughout culinary history never been achieved, and you put your effort towards that, 
even if you come really close to figuring it out and accomplishing it, that's like a huge win. But if you actually hit the ball and it goes over the fence, then that's something. Yeah. Is it like a running list of the impossible for you or is it like a, a random idea that pops up? I mean, it, it, both? it's both. Yeah. I mean, like we're, we're talking about changing the gallery concept right now from what it is to something in like a month. And one of the things that we do, we, we create our own list, like you're saying, what have we never done before? What have we never done before because we think it's really hard? or that we think it's impossible. So like, weirdly, despite everyone's work ethic in, in this industry, or in any industry for that matter, people doing hard work is in fact hard. And so if you can chase that down, if you have the, the wherewithal, the stamina, the discipline to, to even consider approaching something that is a task that, that is extremely difficult, either from knowledge or physical exertion or organization amongst, you know, the 80 staff we have here and the 130 people that we have coming in. To me, that's, that's worth trying because nobody's probably tried it before, you know. So, you know, we, we try to tackle those problems. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. So when you're at home with your family, do you shut off from the restaurant? Very rarely. There's probably never a complete shut off. You go through phases where you're, it's really hard for me to disengage at all. And that, that could be physically where I work a few seven day weeks in a row. So next thing you know, a month goes by and you really haven't had a day off or what is probably even more damning to personal and home life is when you do take a day off. Maybe today is actually a good example. <laughs> Technically my day off, oh, really? obviously doing this podcast, and then I have a meeting here with the sous chefs, and then I have a meeting with my business partners down at our corporate offices at 2.30, and then I'll go home and I'll get on my laptop, and I'll, I have a to-do list that I wanted to get done today. It might be some emails, it might be some two-dish ideas that I had last night that I want to get on paper so I don't forget them. Next thing you know, it's gonna be seven o'clock at night and your day off is gone. And the people that count on you for that, that time, that attention, you know, they, it, it's hard, you know, it's hard. and it's hard for yourself too. Like as much as they get it, it's still hard. Yeah, like I woke up this morning, I went to, uh, to the Equinox, I worked out, came home, showered, ate something, did some emails, came here. And again, next thing you know, it's gonna be seven o'clock before I'm free. And it's not, it's, it's hard to have relationships outside of your profession if you don't really take that breaker and slam it off. Sure. You know, never been good with that. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a moment or time that you realized you had made it as a chef? Oh man, I mean, there has been, but oddly that only lasts a second, a day, a hmm. week, or a month, yeah. and it disappears because there's another obstacle, another challenge, or, you know, like, the most literal example would be, like, I remember in 2010, I think it was, on the world's 50 best list, we came in number six in the world, and we were number one in North America, and you're going, wow. Like we eclipsed the French Laundry and Per Se and all of these amazing restaurants in the US and we did it. You know, we did what we said we were gonna set out to do. And then next year you fall to 17. Or you come home from London where the awards were held that year and you get an email from a diner that had an unpleasant experience. You know, like, it, in fact, I think it was that year that very scenario happened, but instead of an email, I got a package in the mail when I came home from London. And I opened it up and it was a child's book, uh, The Emperor With No Clothes. And there was a letter in the book from a gentleman that had dined at the restaurant while I was at the awards ceremony saying how it was all pomp and circumstance and the food didn't taste good and it was nonsense upon stilts. And so what I did was I had, I still have it in my office right now, if you want to see it. I framed the letter with the book and I hung it in my office. And it was like a lesson, like 
Whether that gentleman actually had that experience or not was irrelevant. It was just a constant reminder to me that the nature of this restaurant runs the edge. Like you were saying, like whether it's the, the interactive experience of the way we present the food, the aromas that are coming in, the, the custom service where we always have to remember that we're a restaurant and the food has to be delicious and the service has to be comfortable and technically proficient. Otherwise, you can do the most crazy, crazy stuff, but it means nothing. Did you want to like write that guy back and be like, sorry, sir, I just returned from being one of the top 50 <laughs> restaurants in the world? No, but for sure I thought it. But I was like, look, you know. Do you know if he's been back? Not to my knowledge. That would be amazing. The letter proclaims that he never would be. So I take him at his word, um, you know, and that was a long time ago. Yeah. So you've been through a lot. I want to touch health wise. Mm -hmm. I want to touch on that quick tongue cancer, which yep. you've been cancer free for 12 years. Yep. Congratulations. That's Thank you. Amazing. So here's what I'm curious about. I've read that you lost your sense of taste at one point yep. and then it returned. Yes. And you see these like crazy videos of people who don't have their vision or their sense of hearing and then they may see for the first time or hear for the first time. And it's these like heart warming, inspirational in a way, videos. Can you describe like the day or moment, like when you got your sense of taste back? I mean, the thing with, with the taste perceptions for me, they, it wasn't a, uh, a light switch moment where they all, it all came back at one, one time. They came in back in pieces. So I was able, I went from being able to taste absolutely nothing to being able to perceive sweet. And that was it. So you could put, you could, one day nothing, everything was like cardboard in the sand. The next morning when I had a coffee and I was still very, very thin and the doctors were urge, urging me to gain any weight that I possibly could through any means. So that meant a lot of ice cream and sugar and junk food because I had dropped to like 129 pounds after treatment. I was throwing spoonfuls of sugar in my coffee in the morning which I am not a sugar in my coffee person at all, um, but was just doing for the caloric intake and I could taste the, the sweetness. And that was like a revelatory moment for me. It was like, wow, it's, it's actually gonna come back or at least this part is. Yeah. Now I can be a pastry chef, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, but then, you know, a few months later, I was able to taste bitter and then finally salt came back. And it was interesting for me as a chef when you think of most trained chefs going into their tutelage or their apprenticeship or education as probably an adult, your taste buds are already formulated, your your flavor memory's already there from going through your childhood, and now you're just learning how to cook. So it's kind of a weird thing. You have the tools, but you don't really know how to build anything with them until later in life. For me, I was, I, that's the experience that I had having my taste buds, going through childhood, making those flavor memories, going to culinary school, going to the French Laundry, learning how to apply them to, to a trade, and then having them all go away and having to relearn it was a very interesting process to be a chef. So imagine if, you know, you, know, you had all of the, you, I mean, you've cooked, you've went to school, you've worked in restaurants, you know like a pinch of salt in your hand you look at a pot, you throw that pinch of salt in that pot of chicken stock in your head before you even taste it, you kind of know how salty it's gonna be. Well, I had to kind of go through that all the way again in the reverse, which is incredibly educational for me as a 33 year old culinarian, you know? It taught me a lot about the synergies of, of flavor, how, how sugar and, and salinity go together, how balance and salinity go together because you never are able to really pull them apart as an adult. So it was cool. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it, yeah. but it was cool. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, how, did you, how did you keep going like, during that? Like, how, did you keep, how do you keep your hopes up and keep going? I think, you know, it's not, it was a combination of things. I don't think it was a Superman type moment. I think it was, you know, opposite at the times. There was, there was certainly periods of desperation and isolation where you're just like, well, 
if everything else is going to be stripped away, I need to really hang on to that one thing that means a lot to me. You know, there was a lot of determination. There was a lot of proving people wrong. Like, when you think of Alinea, I can't tell you for better or worse how many people when I left the French Laundry and they knew what type of cooking I was going to do, they flat out would tell me to my face that you're going to fail. Nobody wants that kind of food, you know. Sure, Ferran can get away with that in Spain, but nobody in America wants that kind of food. Land at Trio in June of 2001 and come in as this young kid, 26 years old, trying to blow the walls and the ceiling off the food world. So everybody's saying this is going to be terrible and you're going to be out of business and you're going to be crawling back to the French laundry and cooking classical French food in a matter of months. And then 9-11 hit. You know, a couple months later, and everybody was retreating to meatloaf and mashed potatoes and comfort food because our whole world got flipped upside down and they just wanted something that they were familiar with. So then it further, you know, exaggerated that sense of we don't want anything risk taking. We don't want a challenge. We want comfort. But you just stay the course. So I think that set kind of my path of like, if somebody tells you you can't do it, you have to really go for it. You know, yeah, I get like I get that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, then I've had a few big instances in my life where mm -hmm. that's happened, and I'm like, oh, really? You're yeah. saying I can't do this? See? I'm gonna go yeah. and mm -hmm. freaking do it, <laughs> right? But it's interesting because you use these moments, I don't want to say to propel you, but I guess to yeah, overcome them in a way. But you, but you could you, you could look at them one way or the other way, and in a way, they're they're um, a macro version of like I was saying when we're trying to create a specific dish where we chase the impossible and people say that's impossible you can't do that it just makes you want to do it more yeah you know for sure yeah how do you innovate here, <laughs> here loaded question but it's evolved a lot over the last 15 years you know we're about to celebrate our 15th anniversary in May of this year you know in the beginning it was very it was very much me staying here until four in the morning uh, sitting in the dark in the dining room, like writing dishes out on paper, reading books, being online, um, researching. And now it's blossomed into this full-fledged, really, really collaborative environment where there's probably, I'm going to go with somewhere between seven and 10 people that are like really involved, which is fantastic because you get all these different perspectives and there's a lot of editing that happens. Like I remember in 2005 when we first opened, you know, I would have a fairly good filter, but man, if I got my head set on something and there, there was nobody that was going to say, Hey chef, maybe that's not such a good idea. And even if they did, I wouldn't listen to them. But now we have this group, we have a lot of soundboards. So it's great. And you know, the internet has changed everything so dramatically with information sharing and press cycles. So like now I can pick up my phone and figure out what Rene Redzepi is eating while he's on vacation in Japan. He's going to tell us all what he thinks about it. He might even tell us how he's going to apply it to a new menu at Noma next year. Now I need to make a choice. Do I avoid all that like the plague? Because we don't want to be known as a restaurant that emulates or copies any other chef or restaurant? Or is it a tool to see through his lens, through his eyes, what is happening in the culinary world, either in Copenhagen or in Japan or in Tulum or in Lima. And I've never been to Tulum. I've never been to Lima. So now I can pick up my phone and do this instant research, which is really valuable. And that, you know, that can become inspirational. But at the same time, I feel like it's muddied the waters a lot. It's blurred so many lines of identity with everyone. It's become very dangerous. Yeah. So, you know, like, it, was, it used to be in order for me to be inspired by another chef or restaurant, I had to either own their cookbook or there was, like, Gourmet, Food and Wine, The New York Times. Pre, we're talking pre-Instagram, pre-Twitter, 
even I remember in 2002, there was the the food website called eGullet.com, right? And that was like one of the first ones where you could see what was going on in the world, you know. And so trends happen in a heartbeat now and influence spreads. You know, when you look at all the restaurants in, in Mexico, Mexico City, South America, how much of them are emulating the success of Noma and that new Nordic culture, a lot. So like what happened to the boundaries of regionality and specific style um, and originality, it's really interesting and, you know, for better or for worse, you know, you just have to be very disciplined on who you want to be and what you want to express through food. Yeah, I know you're pretty wowed by uh, Vespertine in yeah. LA, yeah. which I'm dying to, to get over to one it's of amazing. his places. Yeah. I was, ta- I, ta- I interviewed Nancy Silverton a while ago uh-huh. and she, what's his other one? Not Vespertine. Um, Destroyer. Destroyer. Yeah. yeah. She had just eaten there, which was yeah. funny. She took inspiration from this salad course uh-huh. that he had for Moza, right. which I thought was interesting. Listeners should note that you just put salad in in finger quotes because yeah. <laughs> obviously anything Jordan does isn't um, what you would typically yeah typically think of as a salad. Yeah, for know? sure. Yeah. Do you get? I, I guess you said you don't eat out much. Like in Chicago, is that because of your schedule, or is that because of you go out to eat and it needs to be worth it? Not taking anything away from Chicago dining No, scene. for sure. Actually, I've been eating out here a bit more lately. In the past, if I'm in town, yeah. I'm at work. I'm at one of the restaurants. So I would always joke that I eat out in New York City far more than I do in Chicago, which is weird. You know, <clears throat> recently, I, I went to Smith for the first time about a month or so ago, embarrassingly, because he's been open for three years or so. And it was amazing. And, you know, sure, I can say I'm biased because I've known John for a long time and he used to work for us, but just always impressive to, to simultaneously, and this happens at Vespertine too because he worked for us, but simultaneously understand the chef's creative process because you know them personally but also not know how they're doing certain things, which is inspiring. So there's, a, there's this weird juxtaposition of the unknown and the understanding that come together to make those meals really special for me. Yeah, it's just really, I think Chicago is doing, doing an amazing job of, of, I remember staying relevant and staying moving forward. So I remember for the, it, when Alinea first opened and Moto, Omaro still had Moto, and there was a lot of other restaurants. You know, Graham Elliott Bowles was at the Peninsula, and, and Curtis Duffy was doing some stuff either at the Peninsula or when Grace opened. And there was a lot of articles, even in the New York Times, saying Chicago is no longer the second city. And they were proclaiming that Chicago was rising above New York City in terms of culinary proudness and it was like wow this is amazing yeah. you know everybody would assume it was either on the coast and everybody would assume it would be san francisco and in new york and every and people very very well-known food writers are saying no chicago is it right now well that's amazing to to achieve that and a testament to all of our hard work in in the midwest here and really creating a culinary community it's another thing to maintain that for 15 years And, you know, now everybody is clamoring about L.A., which is amazing. But, you know, let's not overlook the fact that Chicago is still a really, really wonderful food city. And um, I'm really proud of that. Like, I think I think the fact that it's unexpected. Yeah. Makes it even more special. Yeah. I feel like when I was in culinary school, I don't know, almost 20 years ago, it's like, obviously New York, but San Francisco. Yeah. Well, San Francisco is still is great, not right. taking anything away. And right. I did my extern in LA okay. in like early 2000s. And it was like, like Spago was still the hot yeah. place, you yeah. know? I think, I don't know, Campanile? I don't know if Campanile was open. I don't remember. Probably, yeah. yeah. But yeah. there wasn't a ton no. happening, you know, different. And now look at it, you have, you know, you have Vespertine, you have Dave Barron out there with Pajoli and Dialogue. You have a huge explosion in that upper mid 
So, you know, Bestia and Baval are amazing. And there's just so much out there now. Um, it's great. And man, the weather is... Yeah, trust me. I mean, <laughs> my wife and I both live there separate times. And every time we land, we're like, why the hell do yeah, we live here? Why, why? Yeah, why? Hey everyone, wanted to quickly share a little about Cook Tracks, which I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, since this is the last episode. We're in production for another series of Cook Tracks. We have four incredible chefs that are taking part um, this round. Cook Tracks is a project that the team here at Beyond the Plate has been working on for well over a year. As we say, it's a brand new way to cook. It's an audio recipe cook along. If you follow at Cook Tracks on Instagram, you may have noticed a lot of people are starting to cook these actual recipes, which is the point of them, and they're really enjoying it. So if you haven't checked it out, give it a listen or give it a cook. Basically, in each episode, a chef or culinary personality is right alongside you, more or less, taking you step by step through a dish or a meal in real time. So you're going to hear tips and tricks and stories that'll keep you entertained while you're going to up your cooking game a little bit. So no recipe reading needed for this. No pausing and playing a video. We currently have six episodes that we did. The first round with Rachel Ray, Rocco Despirito, Gail Simmons, Stephanie Izard, and Chef Jimmy Papadopoulos. You can get more information and updates at cooktracks.com or on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So thank you for listening. You, we mentioned earlier the the gentleman that's shocked he didn't like Yelp. I don't know if Yelp was around yet, but sent you, you know, the book and uh-huh. all that. So I have to imagine he, here every every dish or component is thoroughly tasted, tested, mm-hmm. you know, yes. before service. So I'm curious your perception or if you read reviews, because something like that, you I, I, I suppose you go one of two ways. It's like... This person doesn't know what the F they're talking mm-hmm. about on one side. Yeah. And on the other side, it's like, wait, th- I'm, ne- I'm, I'm, I'm reading through this and something may be off and you kind of have to go back to that night and see, you know, is there something to fix? I think that's also evolved. I used, when I was young and a lot more immature, I would get viscerally upset about anything negative, right? And I would... I would simply dismiss it as they don't know what they're talking about. Now I think you have to do your due diligence and investigate because the fact of the matter is, you know, we, we're a busy, busy restaurant seven nights a week and people make mistakes. So every day um, at around four o'clock, we put up the in- every component of every dish on the menu goes up to the pass. And myself and the chefs, the sous, uh, the executive chefs, chefs cuisines, taste our way through it. And a lot of adjustments are made. So that little stop gate right there tells me that, well, maybe that's a new cook or maybe he, didn't, he or she didn't get trained properly. And so it needs a little bit of tweaking. Had that not had happened, then I would have agreed with maybe something wasn't seasoned properly. However, there's also the fact that I keep, I brought up like, you know, 130 people come into this restaurant on a nightly basis. Let's face it, if there was a plate of food between you and I right now and we were sharing it, you might want more acid, I might want more salt, who knows? So weirdly, the chef seasons for himself, not based on his personal preference, but based on a very medium sampling Interesting. of 100 or so people. Yeah. Like if you get too aggressive one way or the other, you're, you're going to fail a lot of people. So you kind of have to dumb it down, huh. weirdly, Interesting. in order to make everybody happy. Yeah. Which, which sounds kind of weird coming from a chef that you would assume would want all of the control and the big giant stamp of approval. You just have to know your audience, you know? Do you read reviews in general? Yeah. Because I'm curious, because yeah. you make that point of everyone's taste buds are different. Yeah. And, like personally, I lo- I probably mentioned this before on the podcast. I love John- like I loved Jonathan Gold's you know uh, writing uh-huh. in LA. Yeah. Yep. Rest in peace. But yeah, you know I I, uh, I just feel like there's so much clutter and trash. Per- I mean, there's good writers, but. You know, someone will say, oh, I don't want to go here. Uh, So-and-so said it wasn't good or the X, Y, Z wasn't worth it. And I'm like, but that's that one person who ate that, you know. I think there's a very artful and 
responsible way with criticism. And it's, it, ironically or not, it's very, very much the same as what I just described as being a chef. That writer can sample a dinner experience from a restaurant and write about it based on their personal preference. But what they should be doing is writing about it with at least the awareness yeah. of their readership. That's why Jonathan Cole was so good. Right? Yeah. So, like, you might say, oh, that dish is way too spicy, but, you know, how do your thousands of readers feel? And do you take them into consideration? Yeah. You're like, it's a Thai dish, and traditionally yeah. that dish is spicy. Right. <laughs> and what is the expectation? Yeah. And, you know, the thing that's becoming really difficult now in, in 2019, 2020 will be even more so, is that how do you write about any topic without letting other elements that have, of society come in and influence it now? So, which could be good or bad. So like, you know, all of the movements that we've had in society, if you're writing about food, say, and I, there's been a lot of debates with food writers and everywhere from Austin to LA to New York. Some people will refuse to go into a restaurant and review it if the chef or the owner has had lawsuits put against them for harassment or inequality in pay or that sort of thing. These are all really tricky things that we're all still trying to figure out how to navigate because they're so new. And I it's hard to be to to read reviews that are heavily influenced on opinion before before they even go to the restaurant. Yeah. You know, it's hard. Yeah. It's just a weird it's a strange world right now. Yeah. And Absolutely. we're all acclimating. You yeah. Know? So on the flip side, you've received an incredible amount of accolades. Mm. What's your point of view on them? Do you celebrate them? That's also changed a lot over the last yeah. fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I the internet has changed a lot of the uh, legitimacy and, and power of some of those awards. Maturity and of myself and the restaurant has also changed the perception. Look, it's never, ever bad to be told that what you put your life's work in is appreciated, for sure. And it's really cool for me to have a team here at Alinea or of 100 people and when I think of Next and Royster and the Aviary, people really devote themselves to, to the passion that we provide every night. So whenever we get a restaurant award or if I get a specific chef award, it, it really makes me feel good because we've had so many people come together for a unified goal, which is pretty rare. Like when you think of a sports team, it's the easiest analogy. If you have a basketball team, there's five people on the court. Like they have to work together as a team to achieve the goal. There's a hundred people here that have to do that. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And if, if any one of them is not fully committed, then there's the opportunity for it to break down. That's a tremendous achievement on all of our part. You know, they don't, Interestingly, it doesn't drive. Like, I remember when in 2007, when we first got on World's 50 Best List, it, our website crashed. We had so much traffic. It doesn't move the needle that much now compared to what it used to. Now, imagine our Chef's Table episode on Netflix. Still, that was, what, four years ago? Yeah. Still to this day, when I come out here and do the desserts on these tables, I'm going to go with six to seven out of 10 tables mentioned that show. That's so great. I mentioned it to Nick because I watched it a little while after it aired. And I mentioned it to Nick at like a beard event yeah. a, a couple years ago. And he looked at me and smiled. He's like, the gift that keeps on giving. Yep. Or <laughs> I mean, what a great, you know, what yeah. a great thing. And people, it's a, it's a story and it's a, it's a, it's a victory story with the cancer and it's creative and it's just like a, the most perfect commercial that you could ever want for anything. Totally. But it's interesting. I think people prioritize specific accolades less now than they used to and they, they want to know the personal stories. They want to know where the ideas come from. They want to feel the heartbeat more than see the shiny metal. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we mentioned your partner, Nick. What three words would you use to describe him? 
<laughs> as you're smiling. <laughs> I only get three. <laughs> um, we'll make an exception this yeah, one time. Four. I would, <laughs> I would say intelligent, loud, and responsible. Hmm. So he's outspoken. Yeah. He's very smart, yeah. Like, but he's outspoken, yeah. And I'm not gonna like be specific because whatever you could look it up, yeah. <laughs> but you seem like opposite in a way, maybe not. But explain this relationship, like the balance. How like how does it work? Why does it work? Well, I think there is very much a lot of opposite that balances. You know, I think there's also a lot of similarities where we're both only children. We both grew up. At, in a, at a young age with, with some similar backgrounds and, and family and upbringing and that sort of thing. But then there's a very obvious split. You know, he often says, you're very narrow and very deep in your focus, and I am very wide and shallow. I know a lot of things about a lot of things on the surface, and you know a lot of things about one thing going very, very deep, and that's cooking in restaurants. You know, we complement each other in, in that way, but also we're very respectful of staying in our own lane. Yeah. You know, like, like do you do a taste? Does he, does he like attend a tasting? Occasionally. And yeah. Uh, occasionally. And, but he never, like, we were, we were meeting yesterday about something and, I can't remember the exact analogy, but he was like, oh, yeah, that's going to affect you because now you might have to be in that kitchen, you know, for 14 days in a row working 16 hour days. But I can't do that. I can't walk into that kitchen. I can't cook. I haven't done it in 15 years and I never will. So we have like a very we have a good set of parameters on who's responsible for what. Yeah. And they're, op they're different things, which if you can get along and respect each other as business partners, it just allows you to accomplish so much more. I, I trust him in those four things that he's working on that are his specialty. And he goes, hey, I know you have this Tokyo menu with Chef Ed, and I know Alinea's new gallery is going to be fine. But like even yesterday, he's like, hey, I have an idea for the new gallery. You want to hear it? And I'm like, of course. You know, because for him, he's an avid reader and he, he has a different education than I do. So there might be things in, in culture that might be on his radar that aren't mine. And if he just simply goes into a five minute description of an idea, I might take that little nugget and go somewhere else with it. It's really it's really been a great unexpected partnership. When I first met him, I thought. He's just going to be like this angel investor and then he's going to go away. And I think he thought that too. And then it developed into something much more. Yeah. So I got super great. lucky. That's great. Yeah. So this last section here is on social impact and, uh -huh. and giving back and all of our guests and chefs and restaurateurs do it in their own way, in different mm -hmm. ways. Are you still coaching for a Boku store? Not directly. I'm okay. involved like on an advisory level. Got it. Yeah. I was curious because like that was a huge thing for Chef Keller and yes. mentoring the next generation. Right. I was curious, right. like, is that part important to you? For sure. And it, it it's increasingly so as I get older. I'm only 45 now, but you know, having that Alinea has been open for 15 years. But more importantly, I think the young cooks that are coming into Alinea now at the age of 22 are very different than the 22 year old I was when I entered the French Laundry and the industry is massively different. So the mentorship now is way more important, I think, for the future of the culinary industry. It needs some nurturing right now. So that's something that is coming up more and more on my radar just for the industry yeah. specifically. Got it. Yeah. So could you tell me about any other organizations or causes that you're proud to support? Yeah, we obviously, we funneled all of our resources, both time, financial, to directly to the University of Chicago, specifically for cancer research. Obviously, very close story to me. So I think every year we at least do one benefit dinner here at Alinea where all the proceeds go to research for for cancer care and prevention. I think we've raised well over two and a half million dollars for them, 
over the years because that's very much, you know, I went through a clinical trial. Had that clinical trial not previously been developed by research dollars, then my outcome would have been radically different, right? So I can, I can understand and appreciate that, that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the money that we're raising, there might not even be head and neck cancer. You know, it might be a vaccine. It might be treated like with a simple shot instead of weeks of radiation and chemotherapy that I went through. At Next, right now, we're doing a portion of our sales on a nightly basis are being directed right to World Central Kitchen, which is Jose Andreas's foundation benefiting a lot of uh, communities in need around the world. So he's done a tremendous amount with the wildfires in California, the hurricanes in, in Texas and in Puerto Rico and earthquake relief in Haiti. And so what's interesting to me with him, with us supporting his foundation, with me being very vocal about cancer uh, research, both directly to University of Chicago, but also in the memoir and the various articles that have been written about me and being open about the story, chefs now have a tremendous platform. Where if you think 25 years ago, before Food Network, before you know Top Chef and the reality cooking shows, before Gordon Ramsay and, the, and Bobby Flay, it was, sports stars and actors and actresses that were able to be the mouse, mouthpiece for, for benefit. Now chefs can, can raise money, they can raise awareness, they can do all these things, which we're very much a part of. And I, I really think it's amazing for us to be able to reach people and inform them and raise money. So we try to do that as much as possible. That's great. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Could we do a quick speed round here? Yeah. Sweet. What did you have for dinner last night? Sushi, to go. To go. Yeah. Name a smell in the kitchen you love. Roasted garlic. Name a smell in the kitchen you hate. Bleach. What pisses you off in the kitchen? Noise. What makes you happy in the kitchen? Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> this last question I've written down so many times in a row and I'm just like, yeah, I'm not gonna ask it, but. But you are. It's a season closer, so I'm asking it. Okay. Have you had the Popeye's fried chicken sandwich? I have not. And <laughs> honestly, I didn't even know what this whole thing was until somebody explained it to me like two weeks ago. Really? Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> uh, that's funny. All right, so closing here, during the, we've talked about Thomas Keller a lot and, and during our episode one this season, he mentioned to me that you once said to him, like there's somebody today in your kitchen at Alinea that's gonna blow you out of the water. Uh -huh. So for the young cook, captain, server, hospitality culinary student out there yeah. that's read about you, watched you on chef's table, yeah. what advice do you have for them? The culinary world has changed so much at such a rapid clip in the last, anywhere from 20 years to today. But I feel like the fundamental principles that were taught to me and that were taught to Chef Keller and probably were taught to Roland Hennen that taught Chef Keller, they all still apply. Their, their patience, discipline, dedication to the craft. And, you know, people often ask me, like, where do these ideas come from? Pull back the the curtain so we can see the magic show that's going on in your head. That honestly is the easy part. The hard part is really laying down that core foundation and the only way that you can do that is through patience and discipline and dedication to, to the craft of cooking. And so now, especially in today's world with social media and the internet and we're all carrying around computers in our back pockets, Speed is, is prioritized and is paramount, and it's really important to, to take, take focus and be methodically slow about things certain times. Well, thank you a ton yeah. for, for sitting down, taking the time. It was great, great, great talking and getting to peel back a little bit of that curtain. Yeah. I, I don't know, man, just how, how you, your point of view on things is, is eye-opening and inspiring because I think some people are too tunnel visioned. And I remember I worked for this chef 
been restaurateur in Miami a while ago, and they were always saying like, take your blinders off. Yeah. Like, take your blinders off. For and there's sure. more than one way to look at something. hundred percent. You know, so it's, it's really fascinating and interesting how you look at things. And I don't know, I'm curious what Alinea looks like at 25 years. Oh man, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Quote from Chef Grant Ackett's, which I'll paraphrase here. What's interesting to me, chefs now have a tremendous platform. Now chefs can raise money, raise awareness, and do all of these things where we can reach people and inform them and raise money. And we try and do that as much as possible. Thanks again to Chef Grant Ackett's. Find more on him at aliniarestaurant.com. Find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media platforms at On Cappy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is on Twitter at BT Plate Podcast and Facebook. This episode was produced by myself along with Ian Cohen, Joe Yeaton, and Chant Petrosian. Thank you to Tom Osborne. Our music has been composed by Goldford. As always, a very special shout out to my wife, Katie. Please rate, review, and or subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy, and remember, there are never too many cooks in the kitchen.